Well, I see that uh, the numbers are still growing exponentially here in terms of participants that are joining us. Uh, my name is Mauro Sardella. I'm the director of the Central, Central Research Facilities here at the Materials Research Laboratory at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Uh, welcome every single one of you guys who took the time to join us. We're starting today the MRL Facilities uh, webinar series. Uh, we have uh, the basically our plan is for every Thursday at the same time, noon central time, we'll have a, a presentation uh, covering several aspects of what our facility offer, but mainly focus on tutorials or advanced uh, characterization techniques and fabrication techniques involving common uh, processing and uh, metrology tools that we have here in the Marel. So you can see that there is a website for you to have more information about that. Uh, again, uh, the, the, we would like to ask you to type your questions in the chat window in the Zoom software so that we can read the questions in the end. Please mute your microphone as you join in if you have not done that and refrain from actually starting your video. We'll take care of the questions. Uh, some, some items that people would like to be, we are recording this event. We will be reviewing it and if appropriate, it will actually be posting the video online for you to, to revisit later or share with friends. Uh, I understand the, the presenter today uh, will be, re, will be pre, uh, making the, some, most of the slides available for us to distribute. And uh, the presenter prefers that you contact her directly by email requesting this. Uh, next week, we already have a lineup for, for you. That's Dr. Rodel Remy, our expert in uh, polymer and soft materials characterization. We'll be giving a seminar covering exactly his topic of expertise, which is like DSC, TGA, and uh, polymer and soft materials characterization in general. So don't forget to tune in next week. We'll be sending an email for the Zoom registration Thursday at noon time as well. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce today's presenter, uh, Dr. Kathy Walsh, which is a senior research scientist here at the Materials Research Laboratory. Uh, she got her PhD and master's degree at the Michigan State University, East Lansing. And since then, she joined us uh, initially as a postdoc and later as a, as a sci staff scientist since 2013. So she is in, have involved in many aspects of the development of the technique, atomic force microscopy, and all different uh, subsets of measurements and related techniques, and also in nanomechanics as well. So with that, I would like to give the word to Dr. Kathy Walsh, and thank you for doing that, Kathy, and thank you, thank everyone for attending this event. Thank you, Mauro, for the kind introduction, and thank you, everyone, for uh, spending your lunchtime learning about atomic force microscopy. My talk today is going to cover the basics. Um, there are plenty of tutorials out there on different aspects of atomic force microscopy, and my goal with this talk is to prepare you to be able to watch YouTube videos and sort of skip the first few intro slides. I work here at the MRL. For any of you who are not currently MRL users, know that you're welcome to come use our instrumentation or to collaborate with us on projects. A couple of useful websites are mrl.illinois.edu slash facilities. You can email the MRL facilities address or you can email me. My email address is going to be on the last slide and I'll direct you to uh, whoever the most appropriate person is to answer your questions. First, I'll start by talking about how atomic force microscopy works in some detail about how the instruments work, and then I'll highlight the most common applications. You can do a huge amount of stuff with AFM, so much cool stuff, but I picked out the top few things that people ask about most often. So the odds are fairly decent that you will be doing one of these things at some point in your AFM career, should you choose to use AFM, and I think you should. Then towards the end, I'll mention a couple of things that tend to come up when you're doing measurements and give a brief example of image processing or how to make your publications look better. First, I'll start off by defining atomic force microscope. It's 
atomic force. It's measuring the forces between the atoms in a tip, which I'll talk about a fair bit later, and the sample, which you already know about or you want to learn about. It's a microscope because it gets you surface topography. The AFM is looking at the actual surfaces. So if you're looking for a technique that can probe a little bit below the first couple of nanometers, you might be interested in a, a complementary technique. Despite the word atomic, you usually can't get atomic resolution unless you try really hard, but most people don't need that. Now that's lateral resolution. You're usually on kind of the nanometer scale for that, depending on how much money you want to spend on a tip and depending on your uh, sample features. Where AFM excels is in vertical resolution. This image down at the bottom of the screen, highly oriented pyrolytic graphite, HOPG, you can see a, a single atomic step on this somewhat lumpy stepped surface is easily resolved. There's, there's uh, no ambiguity there. So AFM has resolution usually in the several tens of picometers. And AFM is at the basic uh, level comprised of a tip at the end of a cantilever. A cantilever is a beam that's suspended at one end and you raster or move back and forth the tip over the surface to build up an image. This can be of topography or it can be of some other complementary um, uh, measurements of the sample depending on what kind of tip you use and also on uh, how you set up your instrument. I'm going to talk about just the most common um, uh, AFM measurements that people will want to do. This is not in any way exhaustive, but um, many people who come wanting to do AFM are looking for features on the scale of a few nanometer or a few um, uh, angstroms tall to a couple of microns tall and image sizes of maybe about a micron to about 100 microns on the side. Your sample's physical size depends on what instrument you're using. There's not really a problem with having tiny samples in the AFM, but if you have samples bigger than about a centimeter, it depends on what model of AFM you're using. And just a reminder that we're looking at the surfaces and not in depth into a material. If you want to, you can do cross sections and then look at the layers on their sides too, if you want to do a layered structure in AFM that way. This is a basic schematic of how an AFM instrument looks. Um, in this particular example and throughout the talk, I'm going to, for simplicity, describe an instrument that does all the motion in the sample. The X, Y, and Z motion is all moving the sample. Some AFMs move the sample. Some AFMs move the tip. Some AFMs move the tip in Z and the sample in X, Y. But just for simplicity, I'm going to say that we're moving the sample back and forth. And that's just for consistency in the examples that we give. The cantilever with the tip at the end of it is covered in a reflective coating and you bounce a laser off the back of it. And from Snell's law, angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. If you change the shape of the cantilever, you change the angle at which the cantilever is. For example, if your sample is pushing up on the cantilever, then it changes the deflection of the laser into a photo detector. This is an example of what that setup would look like in real life. Um, here I have a sample disc that is a centimeter and a half in diameter. Samples should be mounted flat on a steel disc like this, or depending on which instrument, a glass slide, you can put a whole wafer down, uh, depending on which instrument you're using, you can put down a very large sample and just look at the top of it. Note that you can't actually see the tip in this photograph here. I'll show you some images of the tip later, including right now. If we go from the perspective of the laser looking down on the cantilever, here the tip is underneath and the sample is so far below that it's way out of focus. So this is basically what a cantilever will look like from the top. The laser will reflect off the back of the cantilever into a detector. If you're not encountering anything on the surface, for example, in the lower left-hand corner, you see a diagram where the tip is just hanging out in the air, not interacting with anything, the laser is going to be centered. If something from the sample pushes up on the tip, it's going to deflect the laser. Now, I've exaggerated this a great deal. It's actually not exaggerated that much, but just to make it easier to see. 
Physically, AFMs are relatively small instruments. They're generally a small tabletop size instrument, but they're often in large acoustic enclosures because AFMs are sensitive to vibrations. For perspective, that cantilever holder there is about the size of my thumb. The uh, image on the right is from an optical microscope. The cantilever is hanging off the end of that support chip and the tip is pointing up. But you can't actually see the very end of the tip because it's extremely sharp. The tips themselves are usually made out of silicon or uh, silicon nitride or they're coated with diamond-like carbon or they're coated with metal to make them electrically conductive. You can get or make tips that have a glass bead glued to the end of it to make it easier to do nanomechanical measurements. Um, you can put your own uh, chemical on the end of the tip to functionalize it or to make it chemically uh, active with a different surface chemistry. But most people, and that's the focus of the talk, is what most people will be doing, are doing basic general tapping mode imaging and you'll end up using a tip like this. The tips themselves are very sharp. At the end, the radius of curvature is less than 10 nanometers. The radius of curvature is determined by fitting a sphere to the end of an image of the tip and just finding the radius of that. This is what they look like in an SEM. If you buy tips in a box and you wonder which end is up, the, uh, when they come in the box, the tip part should be facing up so it should be safe and not buried in the box somewhere. You can kind of get a feel for how small and thin the cantilever is. If you look at the scale bar in the upper right image there, um, that is showing that the chip itself is roughly half a millimeter thick. It's actually smaller than that, and the cantilever is even thinner than that. If you zoom in, you can see that the tip is pyramidal, and it's not perfectly conical. Uh, the deeper you go into your sample, the further down the, the height of the tip you're going to interact with, so the less uh, good the spherical approximation is going to be and the less sharp the tip is. Most tips like this are pretty cheap, about 20 bucks. If you have a coating on it, most standard coatings only add a few more dollars. If you want a very sharp tip or you want something that's good for measuring um, steep features, you'll pay a little bit more for this. And usually you buy them by a 10 pack. Most AFM suppliers uh, charge approximately the same amount of money for, for the tip, so you don't have to shop around that much. Once you have the tip mounted and the sample mounted, you scan the tip and sample with respect to one another, then process the image. If you want to do any height measurements quantitatively, you can also get those numbers out at the end. The scanning part's what I'm going to focus on next. Here we're moving the sample back and forth. On the right-hand side, you see the optical micrograph of the sample moving back and forth uh, 30 microns each line, and it's moving left to right, but the sample is also slowly moving upwards and northwards, and as it does this, it builds up an image line by line. I'm scanning a really big area pretty fast here just to make it visible where I'm uh, scanning, so let me zoom in. This is a more typical size of an image, a few microns. As the tip and sample, as the sample's moving back and forth under the tip, the instrument is automatically adjusting the tip sample separation to keep the amplitude of oscillation constant, but to keep the, um, the forces between the tip and the sample constant. And the amount that it moves the sample up and down is how it knows how tall the sample is. So as the tip is moving uh, sideways and it feels more force from a bump in the sample pushing up on it, it has to move the sample down to compensate for that. And that's how it builds up the image. You don't have to do just topography. There are other channels as well that you can get data on. Let's start with the very basic contact mode imaging. It's the most straightforward AFM uh, mode to understand because it's basically a record player. You drag a tip back and forth over a surface and as the sample interacts with the tip, it's going to deflect the cantilever a little bit by pushing up on it and therefore you need to compensate by pulling the sample down, and this allows you to figure out the heights in the sample. You're feeding back based on deflection. This is great, but you're also applying a little bit of shear force to the sample. Contact mode is really good for 
uh, a lot of samples, but most people will benefit from doing tapping mode instead. And this is also called intermittent contact mode, AC mode. This is the amplitude modulation version of it. The word tapping mode is trademarked, but tapping mode isn't. It's like saying Xerox with a lowercase x. Everybody really says tapping mode. Here, you're oscillating the cantilever up and down, and the interactions with the sample, the forces between the tip and the sample are going to affect the oscillation of the cantilever. You find the resonance frequency of the cantilever by trying to shake the cantilever at a bunch of different frequencies and finding out where the highest response is. And then you try to keep, you feed energy into the system to keep the oscillation at a constant amplitude. Interactions with the sample adjust that and you can change the uh, tip sample separation to compensate and then build up an image. This is the sort of typical image that many people want from an AFM. This is surface topography. The false color scale there goes from purple is lower to yellow is higher. AFM always uses false color because you can't see photons just by pushing on a surface very gently with a, a silicon tip. One thing to note if you haven't done a lot of looking at AFM images before is that this color bar is the range of colors that are being used to describe heights in the image. It's not the total range of heights that are shown in the image. And I'll show you an example with a polymer blend sample here. On the left, there are a couple of chunks of what's probably debris on the surface. So I've adjusted the color scale so that each of the XYZ coordinates of the surface that's shown there has a corresponding color in the color bar. And that's great for seeing the details of the chunks on that polymer blend, but it doesn't really show the individual fibers very well. So on the right hand side, I went to a, a different extreme where I focused in on just those, those small fibers and let the tall chunks saturate the color scale. So if you see an image like this, know that just because everything is, for example, white and at the top of the color bar does not mean it's exactly that height, it could be taller. AFM is an imaging technique, so you might naturally be comparing it to SEM. Both are good, both have different strengths. AFM's big strength over SEM is that it can accurately measure heights and depths. Uh, SEM has an interaction volume with the sample, so it's not always clear whether a feature that you see in SEM is going up or going down. With AFM, since we're intermittently touching the surface, it's extremely clear what are peaks and, and what are pits. So with AFM, you can get quantitative height measurements. We do have a little trade-off in, in um, uh, that we are actually touching the top surface of the sample, but we have the benefit of not being in vacuum. You can do AFM in liquid. doesn't have to be electrically conductive samples, but you also can't zoom out very far with AFM. Um, the largest... Uh, typical commercial AFMs you'll run into have a, a field of view which is about 100 microns by 100 microns um, in the square image and your peak to valley has to be uh, of the features on your sample has to be on the order of 10 or so microns or less. Like SEM has EDS and other complementary techniques that come with it, AFM has uh, other things that you can measure besides just topography. But most people just want to see what their surface looks like and the heights of features on your surface. When you're measuring, for example, film thickness, a lot of people are looking at 2D materials. Um, a lot of people are looking at polymer films that they've deposited on surfaces. You need a height difference or a step height in order to be able to see how tall your sample is. And here's an example of why. If I just am looking at the surface of two features and I'm just pushing down on them with a tip, I don't know which is uh, thicker than the other unless I have something to compare it to. So if you have a film, make sure there are patches where there is no film. Uh, you can also use contact mode AFM with a little bit more force and try to scratch off if you have, for example, um, monolayer coverage of a polymer film, you can measure the thickness that way. But you do need a height difference. 
if that transition region between where your film is and where your film is not is larger than the typical field of view of an AFM, roughly 100 microns by 100 microns, then there are a couple of similar complementary techniques, which we'll actually be talking about in a later webinar, stylus profilometry and 3D optical profilometry. If you can't make a hole in your film or your material and you have a completely continuous material, there are complementary techniques that can see through the sample. But depending on what they are, you may need to know the density of your material or uh, you may need to know the index of refraction of your material if it's an optical technique. AFM is phenomenal at heights, but it's not so great at widths, especially for taller features, uh, kind of on the order of a micron, you start to get into parts where the um, AFM tip width is really contributing a lot. So if you're measuring a trench, full width half max is not the way to go with AFM. In addition to measuring heights, now you have X, Y, and Z coordinates of every point on the surface, so you can calculate the roughness. Uh, AFM looks at nanoscale roughness, so in this image it would be like the flowers instead of the hills. Depending on your application, AFM may be the best technique to use to measure it, for example, if you're doing single asperity contacts, MEMS devices, things like that, or you may need a larger scale measurement like for example 2D stylus profilometry which is exactly like a record player you drag a diamond stylus over a surface or 3D optical profilometry which we'll be talking about in a couple of weeks. The main takeaway of the comparison among these techniques which we'll get into in a couple of weeks is AFM has fantastic vertical resolution but 2D stylus profilometry is super fast and 3D optical profilometry applies zero force at all to your sample. AFM isn't just for topography though. When you're doing a standard tapping mode image, you actually get a little bit of mechanical insight into your sample for free. You can get either this qualitative uh, vision of the mechanical differences between regions in your sample, or you can get quantitative measurements by doing something like contact resonance uh, or by building up a map of individual force spectroscopy measurements in different locations on your sample. Let's go with the easiest one that basically comes for free. Remember that in tapping mode AFM, you're oscillating the cantilever up and down. Well, if you're interacting with an area where the attractive force between the tip and the sample is stronger, for example, you've got a sticky region, that'll cause a delay in the oscillation of the cantilever compared to the driving frequency. And you'll see that as a shift in the phase, which then you can plot, and this just comes naturally when you're imaging, this gives you a great view of where you have different regions of your sample that have different mechanical properties. But you can't quantitatively figure out what those are without doing uh, some form of quantitative mechanical measurements, which will be the subject of a later talk by my colleague Jessica Spear. The Phase imaging allows you to see different regions of your sample and this can help you identify, for example, if you have a very thin film of, of leftover buffer from depositing some particles in solution, uh, you can see that in phase, just the mechanical contrast. This is a 3D image of the surface of a polymer blend sample. Here, the apparent roughness, the X, Y, and Z coordinates made to, used to make this image are showing you the height of different features. And we're also showing the height of different features using this color bar, so the purple trench up at the top. But we're telling the same piece of information with, we're, uh, with two different methods. So let's continue to use the X, Y, Z coordinates to give you the information about the height of the sample, but yet let's use the colors to represent the phase instead. And this, for phase and for things like magnetic force microscopy, this allows you to identify which regions of your sample have which properties. It doesn't tell you, for example, which part of this polymer blend is BOP and which part is PE, but it will give you insight into where these different ones, these different uh, parts of the sample can be found. If you want to know what is in your sample, you can coat your tip with something that reacts to specific regions on your sample, and you can use that to identify where those um, those regions are, or you can use uh, another technique 
combining infrared microscopy or spectroscopy with AFM. Uh, this diagram is from a paper that was really neat done by one of our users here actually on these little capsules uh, which are fairly large and therefore a little bit tricky to mount. Um, he was identifying um, uh, specific chemistry on the capsules using an AFM that enhances an infrared signal. Um, one convenient thing to do is if you know what is supposed to be in your sample, you can pick a characteristic infrared wavelength and just scan this instrument. Um, you can scan the tip over the sample and see where you get enhanced absorption of that particular uh, wavelength. And this can allow you to identify what parts of your material have what uh, uh, specific chemical um, composition in it. Another thing I get asked about relatively frequently is conductive AFM. This is a great technique for giving you qualitative views of where parts of your sample are more or less conductive. What you do is you have you buy a tip, which is only a couple more dollars than a regular tip, that is covered in an electrically conductive material, usually something like platinum iridium. You apply a bias voltage between the tip and the sample, and you scan, and you see where the current is larger or smaller. And this can help you identify, uh, for example, if there are places in your supposedly conductive material which are insulating, you'll be able to see this. Or you can park the tip on a specific location, ramp the bias voltage, measure the current, and use that to measure the resistance and compare resistances in specific areas. Note that this is resistance, not resistivity. The other thing I tend to get asked about relatively frequently is doing AFM in fluid. If you're working in hydrogels, you really should, if you're working on hydrogels, you really should be doing your measurements in fluid because the mechanical properties and the sizes of things change as your, your sample dries out. You can simply put a droplet on top, you can submerge your entire sample. If you are working with a sample that uh, tends to, that needs to be hydrated, don't let it dry out and then just put a droplet on top because it'll take a while for the sample to fully rehydrate. If you're working with something like particles in, in solution, you have to stick them down to the substrate at the bottom. In AFM, we're applying a very small amount of force to the sample. So if you have, like in this upper left image, if you have a particle floating around in solution and you push down on it with the tip, all you're going to see is that the tip and the particle move down just by displacing fluid, and it's not going to show you much information. So you have to fix your, your um, particles to the substrate. Uh, usually you can just put down something that will chemically interact with them and let them deposit themselves there. Similarly, if you're working in air or fluid, your samples should not flex because the same problem will happen. All you'll do is displace the air or fluid and you're not going to get information about the surface topography. Speaking of sample setup, there are a few issues that can come up, such as sample drip, drift, and there are also tip issues, uh, which I will show schematically. Sample drift tends to occur if you have recently mounted your sample or if you're using something like carbon tape, which takes forever to settle, uh, or if you have a sample that was hydrated that's slowly drying out. Tip artifacts can come because of the tips themselves, but more commonly because of the sample. Um, the number one question I get asked in every webinar, and my guess is, I haven't looked at the chat, but my guess is that somebody has asked this already, is how long does a tip last? And the answer is, it depends on your sample. I've used tips which on certain samples can't even make it through part of a scan without breaking. And if your sample is particularly dirty, your tip will, the tips will tend to pick up particles. When they pick up particles, you can hope that scanning for a while will allow it to drop off the part, to drop the particle off. And that does happen. Um, sometimes it won't though. Um, so the best way to have your tips last longer is to have clean samples with no extra stuff on top. 
if you're working with hard materials, your tip can break or your tip can wear, and both of these will show up in the image. Here's an example on the left. I, had, I was scanning with a sample that was much, much harder than the tip, and the tip was wearing and wearing and wearing and then suddenly would break and then would wear out some more. So I switched to a tip which was made of a much harder material and that allowed a stable image. And this is the same size image on the same sample, just a different tip made of a harder material that avoided the tip wear. Once you have an image, you'll need to process it. AFM images always end up looking like this initially in the raw because it's really hard to get something not tilted on the nanoscale. So we're going to compensate for that by doing the most common uh, AFM image processing technique, which is line subtraction. You take all the lines, all the horizontal lines in the image and you make the uh, slopes of those lines all equal to each other, which will get rid of this tilt but it also introduces artifacts. This particular process here is what's going to make the difference between an AFM image that, yeah, it's okay, and an AFM image that makes you really look like you know what you're doing. In this case, let's take, for example, that bottom blue line that I have there. The sample is fairly flat in that specific area, so um, when it takes the, the uh, slope of the line and compensates for it, it just stays in that average orange level. If I look at the blue line in the center where there's this giant glob there, the height of that big particle is offsetting the blue line that would occur, and so in order to compensate, the software makes these horizontal bands where it's lower to compensate for the tall object. So what you do is you mask it, you tell it to ignore those uh, features that are throwing off the calculation, repeat the process, and all of a sudden it looks much better. If you like, you can display it in 3D. This is what the sample would really look like if you were crawling around on the surface. It's not uh, really colored like this. Um, I have no idea what color this polymer is, but I'm sure it's not purple and, white and yellow. And there is an artificial lighting angle, which you can use to highlight or obscure features. So just be careful with 3D images that you don't end up uh, telling yourself stories that aren't true. And that's what the color bar on the right hand side is really helpful for. Let me give you an example of why you might actually want to exaggerate the sample in Z. Uh, this is a photo mask that was made here at MRL by my colleague Jeff Grau and the height of the um, features on the mask is ooh, somewhere between one and 200 nanometers. So the Z scale here is one to 200 nanometers. The X scale and the Y scale are 5,000 nanometers. So if I plot everything in the correct Z to X, Y ratio, it doesn't really show very much. So this is great for saying what it would authentically look like, but it doesn't give you as much information as, for example, exaggerating this, which allows you to see the individual, uh, like the roughness of the grains in the chrome, uh, see some scratch on the glass. If you're looking at AFM images in the literature and you see what looks like a big white spike, just like you can see on the left-hand side of this trench here, that's due mostly to the exaggeration in Z. And it's perfectly okay to exaggerate in Z as long as you have a color bar that will allow people to actually get perspective for, for what it should look like. This is probably a little bit too exaggerated, but I wanted to make a point. Those are just basic uh, topography, conductive AFM, working in fluid applications. There are a whole bunch of different applications which I haven't gone into, which you can do with whatever AFM you have available in most cases, unless you're doing one of the little Lego AFMs and uh, those uh, tend not to be able to do as much. Um, but whichever AFM you have, you can potentially have accessories for it. And remember, you always have access to the MRL AFMs as well. I'm not going to leave this here for you to write down forever. My point of showing you this is that there are lots of options and you should check to see what's available to you. At MRL, we have three AFMs 
permanently and one AFM that is kindly on loan from a company. Uh, we have two staff who work in the field of scanning probe microscopy, that's AFM and associated techniques and nanomechanics. And there are additional instruments. These are ones that I uh, talked about during this talk. The AFM plus infrared uh, uh, information to give you chemical information on the kind of like 20 nanometer scale. The stylus profilometer, and I want to put in a plug for the upcoming 3D optical profiler webinar, which we'll be giving in a few weeks. Every June, except this June, we, uh, we have the Advanced Materials Characterization Workshop, which I highly recommend you attend. There will be tutorials um, from expanded versions of talks you may have heard before to completely new talks, um, instrument demonstrations, a vendor, vendor show, and uh, you can come and see what the MRL is all about. It is an experience not to be missed. Next week, there will be a webinar by my colleague Rodel Remy on soft materials characterization, uh, thermal analysis, um, dynamic light scattering, what you do to characterize your polymers. If you have AFM questions, please email me or my colleague Jessica Spear. If you can't get enough of webinars, we highly encourage you to attend the um, sort of union of facilities here webinar series, including Mauro Sardella's talk tomorrow on X-ray diffraction, at, um, uh, which you can log on to there. So with that, I'll open things up for questions. Thank you for your attention and thank you for spending lunch with me.